Top Med Talk. It's Monty Mythen here, Editor-in-Chief of Top Med Talk, coming to you with one of our New Year specials. We're probably going to do more than one of these. I'm here in the studio in London, in Brentford, the Top Med Talk studios, and I'm joined, just flown in, by our anchor from the USA and the managing editor of Top Med Talk... Desiree Chapel. Desiree Chapel. We did our Christmas specials with you back we home. Did. How we was did. Christmas in the end? Because they were pre-recorded. It so was pre-recorded. Was it as good as you were anticipating it? Oh, today? much better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're joined. We're joined here. So we're going to do a quick. You know, what do you think is going to happen this yeah. year? We're going to do a few of these just to get yeah. some predictions out there. We're joined some by a very voices. special guest who's been down in London for the last two days working on a secret project. He's a, he's London, a top men talk favorite, by the way. Yeah. A fave. S- Simon, a fave. 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 I never knew that. Yeah, well, a fab, right. oh. a fab yeah, fave. I had to let you in. Simon, how are you? Very well, Monty. That's right. <laughs> Wonderful to see you as always. <laughs> Simon, you're from the most beautiful place in England, York. Is that right? I think it's the most beautiful place. Let's you, not go there. You do dispute it. <laughs> we, won't, we, won't, we won't go there. We've There's done been, that one. There's been many a word backwards and forwards. We've done mm. that one to death, haven't but, we? Well, I, I'm not from York. I'm from, oh, I'm from Liverpool originally, but okay. I reside now in North Yorkshire, yeah, yeah. in York. And um, it's a beautiful city and a beautiful part of the world. Wonderful countryside, great coastlines. So, How yeah, was the holiday? It was lovely. How is beach walking <laughs> with very tired teenagers? Um, slightly more challenging. <laughs> we won't, go, we won't in, go any further. We won't go into that either. I can't wait to hear about that. Right, we're going to dive into some predictions for um, yeah. 2020. We're going to try and avoid politics from that perspective. Okay, yes. we've avoided it. I didn't even say the P word. No, you didn't. I'm not going to say the B word. No, you are not. What's the B word? No, no I'm not hey. going to say Can you just mouth it? No. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yes, so, don't mention that. Because we so. are. Oh, we're not going to say anything else about no. in the rest of the world. The rest of the world. Except... No. Our, our hearts go out to you, Australia. Sorry. Yeah, and other places too. Yes. But moving on, so some predictions. So I'm going to go dive straight in Do with it. prehabilitation. Last year on Top Mid Talk, there was a, a number of different things recorded about prehab. At one stage, there was a prediction that prehabilitation would be the word of the year 2020. And mixed in with that was the suggestion that once you start typing prehabilitation, yeah into something that does autocorrect, that it doesn't autocorrect anymore. Now, my technology has stopped autocorrecting. Is that because the world has changed or is it because... <laughs> you type it so much. <laughs> I type it so much the machine learns from me. Help here, Desiree. Which I, is I'm in the same boat, actually, so I don't know. Is it in the dictionary? I don't know. We haven't checked. No, you're, you're subject to machine learning, Monty. Okay. I think you just type think it so, so much. It must <laughs> be that. <That's> right. <laughs> <laughs> so when I misspell AI. certain things, it learns that as well, does it? Okay, never mind. So Simon, prehab. I know you're a sort of believer, but you're also well, yeah, not what completely do you think about convinced. It? I don't know what it is. And I think because well, it's now think? become synonymous to me with exercising people prior to surgery. I think that's what the term has become or it means to a lot of people now. Um, but that's not really the whole ethos of what prehab is. It's yeah. so much more. Um, the whole exercising prior to surgery, I kind of think it's a good idea. I remain to be convinced it's beneficial. Sounds good. I'd like to see the evidence. There are so many more simple things we can do beforehand, though. We can look at chronic diseases. We can treat diabetes better. We can fix anemia. Smoking cessation, alcohol reduction, all these little things. If that's prehab. Isn't that all prehab that's, as well? Though? That's what I, that, that's my definition of prehabilitation. When I talk to people about we need to start prehabbing our patients, those are the things I talk <clears> about. If I ask my colleagues what's prehab, they'll say exercising patients. That's Do you think there's the bias because of CPET? Mm, I don't know. Well, the images that are associated with it tend to be people running on treadmills. If you look at the sort of press releases, the bit that oh. attracts attention is the idea that if you prescribe exercise so you go get the lycra on and go and to the gym and you prescribe that that everything's going to get better i like the manchester approach i like the fit for surgery concept there we go. Yeah, i that's think great. that's a lot more holistic and a lot more encompassing in terms of what we're trying to achieve so that that prehabilitation there by my take and the conferences I mean, the, the world congress the third world congress was in london last mm-hmm. year in partnership with ed palmer prehabilitation there was talk about fitness in there yeah but most of it was those other things you talked about, yeah. Simon, it seemed. It was anemia, smoking cessation, habit modification, blah, 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 blah. So I, I thought it was all of it. And I thought it was part of it. Okay, And therefore, go. there's a problem, isn't there? Yeah. yeah there's there's a need to get that message. message out of really what prehabilitation is. It's not just about getting on an exercise bike. It's not just, not just about um, you know, fixing your diet. It's a holistic, all-encompassing approach. 
It's about being fit for surgery. Yeah, absolutely. But you'd accept the fact that trying to get a little bit fitter, which might involve a bit more walking before surgery, you're, I think you're saying you're yet to be, it's yet to be clear that going to the gym and being beasted. I am unconvinced that exercise before surgery improves your outcome. But I tell my patients, go for a brisk walk, do some more exercise, get your heart rate up, go a bit more puffed out. Don't overdo it too much. I inherently think it's a good thing. Do you, do you think it's one of the sexy topics of the year if we accept the fact it, it, that's a known unknown? I think it will be. I okay, think proving cool. that that is beneficial and how we deliver it will also be a very interesting option. Desiree, yes. sexy topic of the year? Yes. Where do you think the exercise is going to help? Do I think it is yeah. going to help? I do think it's going to help. Okay, but I think it's more of a I, – well, I don't know. It's a bit of everything. It is. Next sexy topic. Desiree, you go first and we'll come to Simon who's going to push us over the edge. <laughs> 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 the edge of what? Uh, so I – this is controversial. I think one of the predictions for the year is we're going to be talking – I don't know how it's possible, but more about enhanced recovery. In a way, <laughs> I know. I know you gave me that look like just Doesn't stared at me. everybody do that already? No, that's the problem. I've been to a lot of conferences. We all, we're all doing it. No, they're not. Nobody's doing yeah, it. We're not Are we just saying it. we're doing it? Yes. No, everybody think- says they're, they give a carb drink and they may or may not do multimodal – pain management and they're doing enhanced recovery. And we can put a, a link in in the UK for example where we thought we boxed this off in 2013 yeah. or whatever it is. Our perioperative per- quality P-quip. improvement program PQIP. Mm-hmm. We'll put the link in to the Royal College of Anesthetists website, the annual report. Maybe two thirds penetration. Yeah. You know, can't And that's in a country that's been doing it for 20 years. Yeah. What about I Simon? Mean, you do it all the time? We do most of it oh. most of the time. Yeah. But you're right. But that's better than that's better than doing some of it a quarter of the time. But it's still not good enough, is it? That's not my no, five it's not to good die. Enough. It's not my five to die. I perfected the five, just not the two. Yeah, exactly. I think does that I think translate, does it? No, I have no idea what you're talking two about. Two days right now. of starvation and five days of eating is the five two diet. If you do some of it, not all <laughs> 80, of it. 20. <laughs> I've perfected the five. <laughs> you're doing ninety nine one. <laughs> but what, what don't you do, Simon? What, what, what don't we do? I don't think we're very good at multimodal analgesia. I don't okay. think we're still very epidural centric where I work. I don't think we've moved on from that very much. We've not really embraced. Can I ask we? you a question, yeah. really quick? Is that a UK thing? You think? I think it's regional. I think there are some senses that... Excuse the pun. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it depends on the sensor. We've always had a good pain team. We, we sort of grew up around colorectal surgery, yeah. particularly very epidural heavy. I, I don't think we've changed particularly with the evidence. I, no, I, well, I think it's interesting because in the U.S., and I think the opioid crisis has pushed this for us, is that we're doing... I feel like multimodal has been a bridge... Um, and an entree into enhanced recovery. So I think if people are saying they're doing enhanced recovery, it's usually because they're doing multimodal pain. Do you think in the U.S. the pendulum has swung the other way? Because I, I go there, I, I talk to colleagues, and if yes. you're having your your lap right hemi, you get some gabapentin and some ketamine okay. and some lignocaine and some dexamethamidine. That seems like a lot of polypharmacy. There is, there definitely is polypharmacy, and one thing that I think the issue with multimodal is, I, I'm not totally against all that because I think hitting receptors, you know, all the different receptors in different ways, I think it's a good thing. One thing I, the one issue that I have is that people don't understand how that affects anesthesia providers are not following up with their patients postoperatively. So they may be doing polypharmacy, and it may look fantastic in the OR, and it may look great in PACU, but what does that look like on the hours and, and days later? So what, uh, that's what my about, issue with What it. about okay. monomodal? They're not completely monomodal, but we recorded we that about methadone. <laughs> like, well, we <laughs> no, did and we did I know what you're talking we, about. I don't think we've done just morphine, for example, for a very long time in the UK. We've been multimodal from the point of view of non-steroidals, paracetamol, a little bit of whatever yeah, for a long so. time. Oh, yes. But, but the newer drugs is. haven't really been embraced, have they, in the UK no. as much? Like what? Um, well, lignocaine is becoming more popular oh. now, I think. But certainly ketamine and dexamethamine yeah. infusions uh, have remained relatively popular um, yeah. within this environment. We, we did an interview with Evan Koresh, Evan Koresh. The, from the uh, editor-in-chief of the journal Anesthesiology yes. last year. And that was all about methadone. That was worth a listen. It was. It was really interesting. No, I, I have, you that? have you been there yet? Methadone, no. No. Not at all. I've got no experience with that. I don't know any colleagues who have either. Um, I mean, it has some very appealing options. Okay. I think in the U.S. that's going to be something this coming year we're going to hear a lot okay. more about. So methadone's on the mm-hmm. list. Because I've seen a ton of programs 
for the the upcoming conferences this year, and I feel like methadone's listed on all of them. What's happening with the cannabinoids clinically in the U.S.? I, you know, I don't know. That's one thing I haven't heard much about. I, I mean, remember. there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> there's quite a funny smell in here. I know. <laughs> there is not. One I mean, no, there's not. Um, CBD oil. You know, I I don't know. Uh, it's it's um, becoming more popular, and I think um, I think more of the question is how do we treat patients that are utilizing uh, cannabinoids at, at home on a medicinal slash recreational basis. Because it's decriminalized how do you, or legalized it is in, in the, very many more places in the yeah, U.S. Yeah, I can't though, remember how many states after this last go around, yeah. but. Um, it's the majority of states. Will isn't you it? cut it out? <laughs> the majority of states now have legalized no, this. No. 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 Uh uh-uh. uh. No, 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 no. Oh my God, I live in alcohol. Kentucky in the yeah. South. It's oh, legalized well, alcohol. Never. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. We produce bourbon, but our, most of our co- counties are dry. But do you think uh, enhanced recovery will really still be on the list or in the USA or globally? I still think it's global. And okay. Yes. Okay. Simon, Sorry. give us one. We know you've got to get you onto a train soon. Where Next are you prediction, going? Closed loop. That's what I see happening next. Oh. Okay, tell what us a bit more mean? about that. Automation, unburdening ourselves of things that we don't do very well and handing that responsibility on to computers and to machines. <laughs> and the two that we have at the moment are fluid management and blood pressure management. Okay, do we have some examples where that's happening already in medicine that you are experienced with? But clo- by the closed loop, there's lots, well, not lots published, but a lot of case studies coming out, mostly from um, Alexander Euston and, and his team. But they've done closed loop anesthesia, closed loop vasopressor management, and closed loop fluid management, yeah. all in the same patients. So this would be the fact that um, you've decided you want to keep the blood pressure at a particular level with an infusion of a drug, a vasoactive drug, and the uh, computer adjust the amount of drug you're giving to keep the blood pressure at the level that you've decided. So Absolutely. the closed loop is not taking you out of the decision making. No, no, it's, it's, it's I mean, the same analogy. It's the autopilot. The pilot sets the speed, the altitude and where you're going. The computer just keeps you there better than he can. He can they can fly that plane better than a pilot. Okay, so I'm uh, going to suggest we change it. This is an epiphany for me over the Christmas period. I listened, I think you did as well, Simon. I listened to a 13 Minutes to the Moon. Yep. By uh, fronted by the wonderful Kevin Fong. Yep. Radio and, 4, great series. And I think it's episode 5 at about 40 minutes in. They're talking about the point whereby they realise that they had to let the computers land them on the moon. Uh, I'm going to play that little clip yeah, to I'll you play now. Clip. Play that little clip. How essential was that Apollo guidance computer to your landing on the moon? Could you have done it without it? It would have been difficult. We practised that. It took a lot more fuel... But we knew that the computer was really essential. Um, and how strange was it for you? I mean, you, you were a test pilot. You flew single-seater fighters. You yeah. used to being completely in control of your vehicle. And now there's a computer there, and uh, it's partly managing how you fly. How strange was that for you, and how did you get used to it? I liked it, actually. It's so proficient with these automatic systems. are so sensitive and uh, so precise you hate to admit it, but they do a lot better job than you do in being efficiently and getting it exactly right. The computer was always on and always in operation. The balance of control between astronaut and computer shifted back and forth. It was a partnership. And well done to Kevin and the team. They won a, they've won a number of awards, I think. Well, they've won at least one, but let's, you know. Let's, <laughs> they should have. Let's, 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 let's never let a good story get in the way of the truth. <laughs> so that was 50 years ago. Okay. So it was the 50th anniversary of landing that Apollo. And even then, they had, been, they no, had no, computers <laughs> that really didn't have much computing power. But the statement that I thought was really powerful in there is when those pilots who struggled to come to terms with it, they said, the computers are just better mm-hmm. at this than we are. And that's why they don't let pilots these days directly fly the planes. It's all there by, are, by it's realization. Pilots realize that computers are better than them. Yeah. Those astronauts 50 years ago realized computers are better than them. But we don't realize that computers are better than us at certain tasks, not everything. When you think about vasopressor control, those closed loop systems change the pump rates 200 times a minute. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We, we There's can't no way. ever do that, can yeah. we? So I think it's a, very, it's a very, very good analogy because I think when the computer was going to land it in a particular place, they looked out the window and saw a whole load of boulders that the computer can't see. Yeah. And they put it on sort of hover across mode until it entered another 
bit that looked good to land on, and then they let the computer land. I think that's a great yeah. analogy. So we're not that. giving these closed loop systems autonomy. No. Yeah. We're just unburdening a, a task that they can perform best than us, but we still set the targets. Fly by wire. Very much so. Yeah. Great stuff. Do you think we're going to actually get our hands on it this year? Sorry. Uh, we should get uh, a set within the next few months for research purposes. Research purposes. But you know, I think they're coming probably not this year, but within the next two or three years, we'll see it coming onto the market a bit more. It will be we, better. We yeah. should probably start talking about it a lot more, get people primed yeah. and ready for it, instead of dumping it in their laps. You know, like if people... Absolutely. I mean, people have to accept it to use it, don't they? Yeah. And we'll see it as a threat. Yeah. And that's a problem. That's why we're so slow to change. We see Good. all these things as threats to us, when actually they enhance our yeah. ability to care for patients. I have a question. Do you yeah. think this younger generation, like young, young, like millennials, will be able to adopt all of that technology more I, easily. I think much easier. I think there's a oh, generational yeah. aspect to this. I think, I think so one of the boomers is going to be going through. And They'll be in the coffee room on the iPhone. I know. Probably the, the, the <laughs> it does, hang on, you're not paying any less attention because you can still you know, fly the plane into the yeah. mountain if you don't get this right. But exactly. the point is, if you've made a decision to give the right amount of fluid to achieve this objective or the right amount of jug, drug to achieve that objective, it just does all the fine print in a way that we don't, we can't yeah. keep track. Like of. you said, two hundred, you know, two hundred changes a minute. This is this wonderful documented phenomenon called um, choice paralysis. Uh, and so, if you, I, have that. I know we, we all have it. <laughs> if you I'm go a into Libra. a shop and there's a hundred things, yeah. you're unlikely to buy something. There's too much choice. You yeah. can't decide. Yeah. And if you go into a shop with seven things, you're much more likely to buy something. And we have this choice paralysis. And it's, it's partly due to data overload. There's it so is. much there. We don't know what to do. So let's unburden ourselves of that, yeah. that choice and give it to somebody else. That's makes cool. more sense. So artificial intelligence is definitely in there. Yeah. It's one of the words still. You could argue that we've been there, but it's progressing rapidly, isn't it? Yeah. It is. And I think... I don't think we've seen a lot of AI in medicine. I think no, we've seen a lot of AI. machine learning, yeah. which is sort of subtly different. It doesn't feed back into itself. But the AI aspect is now, I, I think it's on the cusp of coming mainstream. It's going on pace. So, Any last thoughts, Desiree, before we let Simon go? Any, or Simon, anything else you want to throw in? Yeah. Monty? No. Oh, go ahead, Simon. No, I was just, just saying no. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was just looking at my train time. Well, you can't yeah, get you out of the door. Say, like, it's, you don't worry, it? it'll be late and it'll, well, it probably won't. It'll probably be cancelled. It'll be fine. Well, it'll take four hours longer Which line than, are you than going on? Uh, the <laughs> <laughs> LNER. It's, <laughs> it's all going to be all right. It's going to be sorted out. It's going to yeah. be fine. Yes. They, um, you want to well, talk about the gut here in a little bit? We can add it back. I don't think we'll do that right at the moment because we're going to get someone out the door. But gut, the gut's back on the table. <laughs> I, thought we're doing lab- I thought we're doing laparoscopic <laughs> seizures. We, we know what we're talking about, don't we, Simon? We the do gut, indeed. The gut theory is the motor of multiple organ failure is going to be back. Mainstream. But for 2020, it's coming back, dragging yeah. it out of the dark ages, back into uh, into the light. The unifying theory. Yeah, what's yeah. that one? Well, under perfusion of the GI tract is drives all of the other problems. It's a longer explanation. We'll do it on the next podcast, but yeah. the gut... He's back. <laughs> Some great work going great. on that will come to the forefront in in the next few months. But um, yes, yeah, fascinating stuff, isn't it? Gut is the word. Cool. Yeah. Organ of the year. Great. But you'll All come right. and see it's us. It's good to see you, Simon. See us again, Simon. Thanks a lot, Simon. Happy New Year. And to you too. <laughs> Top Happy New Year. It's Desiree Chapel here. Just a quick reminder: subscribe to Top Med Talk. We're a daily source of news and conversation focused on perioperative care. We bring you all the latest talk from all the major conferences in the perioperative space. We can also be found on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and we now have a free mailing list with special offers and additional goodies for subscribers. Go check us out at topmedtalk.com. That's www.topmedtalk.com.